the, the thing that we're going to be talking about today is um, obeying with, with joy. And what's interesting is when Pastor Jess and them came to me and asked me to do this message about obeying with joy, I was excited. I really liked it. I really liked um, the, the passage. I really liked the material and the content and the fact that I was going to talk about obeying with joy. But at the same time, I thought to myself, if Pastor Jess and the rest of the leaders knew who I was before, or at least met me before, and knew how I behaved, and knew how disobedient I was, I really don't know if they would feel so comfortable with having me give this message today. And that's the truth. I was the most disobedient kid that I knew. Period. I, I definitely didn't really know any other kids that were more disobedient than I was. It was as if disobedience was my natural response to every command or every rule I heard. It was automatic. When I was a child, I would, I would touch things that my parents told me not to touch. When I was in school, I would not even follow the rules on how to take an exam. They would tell me to shade the circle, I would tick it. You know, I would do things like that. When, when um, I'd get into trouble and I'd break the rules, I would end up in the principal's office. I grew a little bit older and I learned how to drive and I made it a habit to run every single red light that I possibly could as long as nobody was looking. At least if the policemen weren't looking. So it seems that I had a huge problem with authority. I had a huge problem with this idea of somebody else having authority or jurisdiction over my life. I had a huge problem with the idea that there can be people on this earth that are quote unquote in power and that they could tell me what I can do and what I couldn't do. Basically though, I was, I was a rebel without a cause. I was doing it for the sake of it. I just felt entitled. I felt like I should be able to know what I should do and what I shouldn't. I get to define what is right for me to do and what I should do with my life. You know, so much of that changed when I became a Christian. So much of that changed when I was confronted by the fact that I wasn't just disobeying laws. I was a hopeless sinner. And the reason why I kept rebelling, the reason why I kept on sinning was because by nature I was a sinner. I was born that way. And I was in constant, constant, constant rebellion against God. And one day I, I got down on my knees and I repented of my sin. And when I trusted in Him, things started changing. And I'm not the same way anymore. But, but even as a believer, I can tell you right now that there are some bad habits that are hard to break. Well, I, I, I've seen some of you do this. I know some of you. Sometimes when I would cross the street, and this would just be, you know, in, in the past, in, in the recent days, I would cross the street knowing full well that where's the pedestrian lane? It's right there. It's right there. But where do I cross? Just several feet to the right. I cross the street. And I see everyone else doing it. It's supposed to be okay. It's almost as if I have a problem with, well, why do you have to be able to tell me where I should cross the street? Right? It's an authority issue. And it's a, it's a thing that we don't really notice, but these are habits that are hard to break. Or in the rare occasion, that I might end up turning left, wherein it says no left turn. My first instinct is to try to talk myself out of trouble. But then I suddenly remember, wait a minute, it is right and it is just for this police officer to give me a ticket. It is right and it is just for me to have to pay, to give, uh, re to, to, to give recompense for what I have done. That is right and that is just. And maybe because of my colorful past being a nuisance to society, I somehow, part of me still forgets how to respect authority, how to respect law enforcers, how to res respect people who have power. But because I'm a Christian, I know I should submit to authority. We know this, and a lot of what we're going to be studying today, we probably already know. But as much as possible, I try to do it, but I keep asking myself lately, do I obey with joy? And this morning, I want to open up the scriptures. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Romans chapter 13. We're going to be going through verse by verse, 1 to 8. And we're going to see what the Word of God says about obedience um, and about the issue of obeying with joy. What, what is the reason why we obey? Remember, we're in L-O-V-E. L is, this, this, these are our core values, by the way. L is love God, love others. And then O is obey God's Word and appointed authorities. Right? And we're going to look at how we can 
obey with joy. Let us read together Romans chapter 13 from the screen if you can. Verse 1, ready, set, go. Everyone must submit. Instituted by God. And those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For government is God's servant for your good, but... Again, for government is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath, who does wrong. Therefore, but also because of your conscience. Continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those you owe taxes. Tolls to those you owe tolls. Respect to those you owe respect. And honor to those you owe honor. Last verse. Do not owe anyone anything. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Today we will learn how to obey with joy. Let's pray. Father, please bless the reading of your word. Um, this is holy ground, O oh Father. We approach your throne of your grace by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, without confidence in ourselves, but with confidence in our Savior, and ask you through this prayer that you would bless us with understanding of your word. Lord, we are here, a room filled with natural-born sinners, saved by grace, by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that as, as we get into your word and what the Apostle Paul has to say about not only obeying you, but obeying the people that you have placed in authority in our lives, may we see that all of this is ultimately for your glory and that it will only root out of a genuine love for you. And I pray, Father, that we would not only claim to believe in you and claim to love you, but we would really obey your word so that the people outside of this place might look at us and see a picture of the gospel. May Jesus' name be exalted above all other names. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And amen. So let us look at what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 3. Now, now remember this. Paul takes Romans chapter 1 all the way to Romans chapter 11 with the deepest, I would say, Romans is my favorite book, with the deepest and most profound explanation of the gospel. He begins by putting everybody in the same boat. Because what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are sinners, whether you're a Jew or you're a Greek. He begins with that. Then later on he says that just because you, are, um, you are, are born a Jew and he was talking to the Jewish people doesn't mean that you have any more of a right to the kingdom of God than the next person. And then he offers hope that the righteousness of God has been revealed to all mankind and it is a righteousness by faith. It is a righteousness that is apart from the law. It is a righteousness that declares people righteous in the eyes of God thanks to His Son, Jesus Christ. It is by faith. And he goes on now in chapter 12 onwards to give practical application. Because we believe in the gospel, because we are saved by grace, because Jesus is not only our Savior, but He is also our Lord, how must we, how must we live? How must we act? And how must we behave? And we get to chapter 13 and He says this, Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. First of all, I think it's very clear what that first word means. It means everyone. Not just certain people. It means everyone. All of us, all the people of God, all creation must submit to the governing authorities. And what does that phrase must submit mean? It's actually one word in the Greek. And in your other translations, it might say be subject. You must be subject to the governing authorities. And the word talks about a soldier's absolute obedience to his superior officer. It's not just like, yeah, I'll listen to you and all those things. No, it's actually being subject. It's also allowing them to have authority over us and submitting to, what does it even say? Government. 
And I know that this is already difficult as we are in the first verse. Because we live in a day and age when the vast majority of the people in this planet do not agree with their government. Think that their government is corrupt, doing injustices. Don't worry, you're not so special. We're not so special as Filipinos. Other, other countries feel that way too. They got people in office who are doing things that they don't agree with. And when they read this verse, imagine Paul is reading this verse to believers who are in Rome. Rome is a polytheistic system. They believe in false gods and they persecute Christians. And Paul is telling them, everyone must submit to the governing authorities. Even the pagan authorities, yes. Who are these and what do you mean by that? There is only one exception in all of scripture wherein we are permitted to disobey authority. It is when authority asks us, commands us, or makes us disobey God Himself. It is when obeying leadership means disobeying God. That's the only thing permitted in Scripture wherein we're not supposed to obey. When authorities ask you to disobey God. Back in the time of the Exodus, um, before all of the things went down, the people that, of Egypt were telling the, the, the Hebrew midwives to do something that wasn't so good. He told, she, the, the people told them, when you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. The only difference between what they're asking them to do here and abortion is a little bit of time. Before in the womb and then afterwards out of the womb. That's the only difference here. And what do they do? The Hebrew midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. And I can tell you with all confidence that in this situation, they honored God. It is quite clear. How about in the book of Acts, when John and Peter were preaching the gospel in a foreign place wherein they were not in agreement with what they were saying? The people called for them and ordered them not to preach or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You listen to that? If a cop told you to do that, if the authority told you to do that, or maybe even if your parents told you to do that, don't tell anybody about Jesus. Stop preaching the gospel. Don't tell anybody about the good news. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. These situations are clear. They're very clear. It is very obvious that they are being asked to disobey God. And in that situation, by all means, honor God. He is the one we should fear, not people. The problem is, a lot of times, we try to justify our disobedience for the wrong reasons. And Paul's going to use an example later, an interesting example. Taxes. Paying taxes. What do we feel about paying taxes to our current government? A lot of us would try to justify and say, oh, well, why in the world would I pay taxes to a government wherein I know for a fact that some of these officials have been convicted of crimes? Some of them have even been thrown in jail. We look at the current cabinet or, or, or certain people in, in the barangay level onwards and we say, that guy should have never been able to run again. He's convicted. Or this, or that, or, or something of that sort. And we say, therefore, I will not pay taxes. I will not support a government that is doing things that, is, that are not good. But what does Paul say? He tells everyone to submit to who? Specifically, to the governing authorities. And guys, doesn't have any exception. Regardless of competency, regardless of morality, regardless of reasonableness or any other qualifier. God doesn't say here, and then afterwards, take out your sheet of paper, write down his qualifications, what is good about him, what is bad about him. When you're able to make a judgment call that this official is good, then you can pay taxes. Or then you can pay association dues at your condominium. If you feel like the condominium people and the homeowners association is actually doing a good job. But if they're not fixing your stuff on time and if they're not doing this and you don't really like how the guards are behaving, withhold. Don't pay association dues. Let them suffer. No, it's nothing like that. 
regardless of anything or any qualifier, everyone must submit to the governing authorities. This is what scripture says. In this same way, remember when Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, first of all, that I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Specifically who? For kings and all those who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Same way that Paul says, well, you got to pray for your leaders. you got to pray for the governing authorities, the, the president and his cabinet and all those people. We don't go around and say, well, I don't know if I should pray for them. Maybe if they improve a little bit better, I'll start praying for, for their family and their good life and their protection and stuff like that. But so far, I don't feel like praying for them. No, that's not what Paul says. He says to all of them. And in the same way, he expects us to submit to our authorities. But why? Really, why obey authorities even if we don't think that they're doing the best job? Or maybe we don't agree with their decisions. Because this is what Paul says. We should submit to them because there is no authority except from God. Paul says something that is groundbreaking to many of the people who are reading his letter. He is saying, that's right. The good kings, the wicked kings, the nice presidents, the corrupt presidents, believe it or not, there is no authority except from God. No matter what you have to say about how some of them behave, their authority has been given by God. It has been given directly from a divine place. He has put them there for a reason. And there is no authority except from Him because He is the ultimate authority over the entire universe. Therefore, all authority comes from Him. There's a purpose, there's a reason. It says in Psalm 103, the Lord has established His throne in heaven and His kingdom rules over all. It says in Proverbs chapter 8, it is by me, speaking of wisdom, Jesus personified or God personified, it is by me that kings reign and rulers enact just law. By me, princes lead as do nobles and all righteous judges. Daniel proclaims that he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. It's all coming from one source. All authority comes from God himself. So those that exist, all authorities that exist, from whatever level you may say, are instituted by God. And it would be clear then, if we study the Old Testament especially, and the history of Israel, that a lot of times, what would God do? He would raise up a righteous leader to bless a nation of obedience. And He would also raise up a corrupt leader to pronounce judgment upon a nation of idolaters, a nation of the disobedient. God does that. A lot of times before we start criticizing, let us look and ask, I wonder why God has placed this authority over me that is not actually doing what's right. Could it be that it is judgment upon a nation? Could it be that God is trying to say something? Could it be that God is calling a nation of idolaters to repent, just like He did time and time again in the Old Testament? And what else is instituted by God? Well, it's not just government. Yes, government to watch over citizens. What else? Church to watch over believers. We are called the body of Christ. If I were to cut off my finger and put it on the ground, I don't think it would live for very long. And therefore, any follower of Christ, you know, there's a lot of people like this, and this is really interesting. I love the Lord, but I hate the church. I love the Lord, but I hate the church. I've had some bad experiences. Well, that's really false logic because you are the church. You are part of that. You are just as much as part of that as the next guy. We are the body of Christ, and God has given us the church, the universal church, and just like CCF Eastwood, the local church to watch over believers. We're to be accountable. Parents have been given by God to watch over children. All throughout Scripture, we see the blessing of what happens when children obey their parents. And of course, even at work, employers to watch over employees. This is all instituted by God. Paul says in verse 2, So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's 
command. You resist the authority, you're opposing God's command. Since God is the one that put them there, disobeying them means rebelling against God. Let that sink in. Every time that you have rebelled against the authorities that God has instituted and put over you in your life, it's not them that you're actually having a problem with. It is the command of God. It is a sin against God. It is rebellion against Him because He is the source of that authority. And we don't really have a problem with our officials in the end. Our problem is the commander above. It is God Himself. And He says that those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. God will bring judgment upon these people who oppose His leaders with the use of the very leaders themselves, with the very authorities themselves. He has given them the right to reward those who are good and punish those who do wrong. And that's exactly the role of government in our lives. So how should we obey these authorities? You might ask yourself, can't I disobey if it causes me discomfort? Can't I disobey if I don't really like or agree with their decisions? How far must I go in obedience? Well, I want to use a primary example. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, He walked this earth one, once upon a time, 2,000 years ago. He walked this earth, an earth where there were authorities, earthly rulers, kings, governors, and all those things. And remember in John 18, before the crucifixion, when He was faced with Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate was asking him, are, are you the king of the Jews? And it was in an almost mocking kind of way. Are you, are you the king of the Jews? And, and Jesus says this, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. As it is, my kingdom does not have its origin here. He states that. And then later on, in another confrontation, right before the crucifixion, he went back into the headquarters, that's Pontius Pilate, and asked Jesus, because he was claiming to be the Son of God, he got scared, he said, where are you from? But Jesus did not give him an answer. So Pilate said to him, you're not talking to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Watch these words. You would have no authority over me at all if it hadn't been given you from above. Pontius Pilate, a governor that was used by God to partake in an act which is the worst human act in all of history. Jesus acknowledges where did his authority to sentence Jesus to death come from? God. And I'm sure that a lot of the people didn't agree with Pontius Pilate. Most of them did. But regardless, his authority came from God. And yet look at how Jesus responded in humility, in submission, because he is the very personification of the word. He is the word become flesh. He never broke the law. He never broke any rule, morality whether it be anything else under heaven or on earth, he was in complete obedience to his father, even with a corrupt government official like this. Later on, we know that Pontius Pilate would make his decision. When he's faced with the facts and he says that Jesus hasn't done anything wrong, he makes his decision. The people say, if you don't crucify him, if you let him go, then you are an enemy of Caesar. And what did Jesus do? He crucified Jesus, he let Barabbas go. Oh, sorry, what did Pontius Pilate do? He crucified Jesus and let Barabbas go. In other words, saying, my ultimate authority is Caesar more than God. So as we try to obey with joy, this is what we need to do. We need to obey with Jesus in mind. You can write that in your frap. We need to obey with Jesus in mind. Because Jesus was in complete agreement with Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. He totally agreed with everything that Paul was teaching here because he is the author. He was God in the flesh, yet he humbled himself and subject himself to human authorities. If this weren't the way of Jesus, listen to this. If this weren't the way of Jesus, there would be no gospel. We would have no good news to proclaim to you today. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that although he was himself God, Jesus didn't use his equality with the Father to his own advantage. And in this amazing act of humility, he is granting salvation to those who are 
disobedient. Those who don't submit to authority. Those who have rebelled against what God has instituted. And those who have resisted Him. The obedient for the disobedient. In my place, He submitted when I didn't. He obeyed when I couldn't. If that doesn't empower and encourage me to obey with joy, I honestly don't know what will. Knowing that my Savior obeyed faithfully till the end, submitted to not just the ultimate authority, but the appointed authorities. Verse 3 says, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but for bad. Not a terror for good conduct, meaning that even godless governments, that's right, even non-Christian governments, even the Roman government at that time, even pagan governments, what do they do? In the end, they all fight crime. They all want to punish murder, punish theft, um, do what is right. And that is the job of government. Even if you don't agree with the values or the faith or of the people in the government, this is what government does. Unless, of course, your government has completely flipped them upside down and just rejected all goodness. There's a difference there. But even godless governments are there to reward good and to punish evil. So rulers, they're not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. In other words, we wouldn't, have, we, we wouldn't actually have a problem with authority and with government if our conduct was actually good. We wouldn't have a problem with them. Because for the most part, what does government do? Fight against crime. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? I think that's a good thing. I spent a lot of time in my life being afraid of authority. Why? Because I was always doing things that caused the authority to jump on me and to punish me. So I hated authority. I did not like authority. And yes, I was afraid. I had fear of authority. And this is what Paul says. You don't want to be afraid? Do what is good and you will have its approval. Do what is good, you'll have its approval. Even if the authorities are not Christians, are not followers of Jesus, any government will approve of good conduct. That's the nature of government. And that's how it's always been. It's crazy how much I can attest to you that this is, this is so true. You know, before I would, I would drive around and any time, I promise you, any time I would see blue and red lights flash, I would freeze. I've gotten pulled over many times before, and I would freeze. Anytime I would see police, I would go the other direction as quickly as possible. Even if at that specific time, I wasn't even really doing anything wrong, I just felt guilty. They were just terrorizing me. I felt like traumatized because of all the times that I got in trouble with them. They were a terror to my bad conduct. They would have been a blessing to my good conduct, but instead, they were a terror to my bad conduct. But now that, that God has saved me from this darkness and made me a new creation, I can tell you, I no longer do these foolish things. And my identity is not that of a lawbreaker, but of a child of God. And I can attest to you that I'm no longer afraid of blue and red lights. And no longer also do I follow the blue and red lights of the ambulance in the counterflow lane. I don't do that either anymore by God's grace. In fact, I can even smile at the wonderful policemen when they pass me by. And it is a joyful thing. I now understand that if I obey authority, there is harmony. Because I'm not committing crime, therefore I can be joyful with the authorities out there. It's fine. I know there will always be corrupt authorities. And yes, it's possible to be victimized by something like that. But God did not make us judge over them. In fact, Peter tells us this. Submit to every human authority. Why? Because of the Lord. Whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or the governors as those sent out by him. To do what? This is government's job. Punish those who do what is evil and praise those who do what is good. Simple. Simple. That is God-ordained authority. And it's properly used by government. And when it is, it's a really beautiful thing. We do our part and they do theirs. If we think that they're not doing their part, we do ours even better. That's the Christian response. That's how we do it. Unless, of course, we are being asked 
to disobey God Himself. Remember, the sovereign God above is the supreme authority and no one has the right to make you resist Him. You know, um, there was this huge, uh, I'm not going to say the name of it, but there was this huge like, controversial viral video all over the place about an airline that kicked a guy out. Yeah, everybody's familiar? Here, was this an air? Okay, so this is the cool thing about social media. You can talk about something. Everybody who's here knows what you're talking about. So, um, you, everybody has their own opinions about the man and about the airline. There were authorities sent. He was asked to do something. Regardless of what you think about their reasonableness as to why they asked him to depart. You can have your own opinions about that. And you can have your own opinions about the man and what he's done. But can I just tell you a biblical perspective? If it is you, step off the airplane. If the authorities of the airline tell you to step off, you step off of the airplane. Paul says, and Peter says, submit to everyone, every human authority. Because you like their decisions? Because of the Lord. That's hard. That's controversial. That goes totally against our understanding of this day and age as social justice warriors and whatnot. Submit to human authority. This is God's design. God designed this because government is God's servant for your good. How? Well, easy. Once again, by rewarding those who do good and punishing those who do wrong. But if you do wrong, be afraid because it does not carry the sword for no reason. It's a little bit scary. So state authorities are put there for society's benefit. Yes, even if the government is not a Christian government, this is their job. Paul, the Apostle Paul, in a, a land wherein they were persecuting people like him, they got him, they arrested him, they were about to lash him. But even he was able to call upon the Roman authorities to do their job. He talked about his citizenship. He was actually a Roman citizen. And when they got him, they were about to lash him. The commander came and said to him, Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, he said. The commander replied, I bought this citizenship for a large amount of money. But I was born a citizen. I'm not naturalized. I didn't get dual citizenship. I was born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about, about to examine him withdrew from him at once. The governor too was alarmed when he realized Paul was a Roman citizen and he had bound him. Later on, Paul would even appeal to Caesar. Appeal to Caesar? Appeal to the person who believes that he is some kind of a God? To the person who, belie who believes that your Jesus Christ, your Lord crucified is foolishness? Is nonsense? Is nothing? Well, when it all comes down to it, regardless of what the authority believes, if you need help, you're going to ask for help. If you need help, you're going to ask and call for them. And that's what Paul did. And even then, even they didn't agree with each other's faith and whatnot, God still used government to do their job. And what does it mean to carry the sword for no reason? What does it mean for the government to carry the sword? In other words, God gives the government the right to inflict punishment on evildoers. The government has the right to do that. Yes, even physical punishment. Have we ever read the Old Testament? It is there. They are our God-given human instruments of justice. For government is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Sometimes, you know, social justice warriors, I love them sometimes. Sometimes they can take it to the next level. So let's be honest, sometimes you see it on social media, the authority is simply doing his job. You know the authorities have the right to flip you over if you try to run away, right? Authorities have the right to, to smack you in the back of the head if you, if you try to hit him also, right? They, they have the right to do that. But the world is trying to flip the biblical truths on its head as if we're the one that has authority. And we, if we see fit, can confront policemen, can confront authorities and say, no, these are my rights, therefore, blah, 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 trying to take out the authority from where it belongs. Sometimes there's good reasons to call out that authority. It's blatant, it's clear. But this culture of these social injustices that we claim to be going, don't we realize that in the end, if we put justice in the masses, in the hands of the masses of society, we will not have the order that we're seeking anymore. We will have anarchy. 
when the people become the government themselves alone it is chaos that's not God's design God's design is that authority government is an avenger and they have the right to bring wrath on the one who does wrong and that's what they do God gives them that therefore you must submit not only because of wrath but also because of your conscience what do you mean I mean it's one thing that you don't want to break the rules because you're scared to go to jail you don't want to break the rules because you know that it's better for you as a person and you're gonna gain something out of it people are gonna like you more it's good to be a good citizen but what do you mean not because of that only but also because of your conscience you must submit because of your conscience listen you know that you are accountable to God and obligated to obey earthly authority since he put them there so we obey not just because we're scared we obey because our conscience bears witness that it is the right thing to do you know it, it's funny because Paul now gives us a very practical application of how we should obey and even support authority and here it is you want to see a controversial practical application of how we're submitting to authority and for this reason, you pay your taxes. That's it. You ever not paid your taxes? You ever neglected to pay your taxes? You ever found a loophole that maybe you didn't need to pay for your taxes? Might not be illegal, but is it necessarily okay also? You know this. Your conscience bears witness to this. For this reason, you pay taxes. What is Paul's reasoning? Because the government is Christian, no. Nope. Because the government is good, no. Nope. Because the government agrees with your viewpoints and your worldview, no. Nope. What is the reason? Everything he said from verse 1 down to verse 5. God is the authority. He placed the authorities there. He gave them jurisdiction. He gave them the right. They punish what is bad and they reward that is good. Because of that, because of God, for that reason, you pay your taxes. Wow. Really? Even if I don't agree with them? Yes. Because God ordained the authorities, we pay taxes. Now, the word that Paul uses for taxes, just imagine this, okay? When he says taxes, for the most part, it commonly refers to taxes that are paid by someone who is living in a land that has been conquered by foreigners and this foreign ant monarchy is now oppressing them, taking their land, and making them pay both income tax and property tax. You're gonna make me pay for you to take more of my stuff? You're gonna make me pay for you to send even more soldiers so you can just have a total monarchy over my land? You're gonna make me pay those taxes? These are the people that Paul's talking to. We're not in that situation anymore in the Philippines. This is our government. This is for our good. These are our people. These are not foreigners. It's been placed by God here. If you were in their situation, all the more you would not want to pay taxes. You really wouldn't. And here, Paul's not only talking about that, he's talking about taxes in general. We are obligated. I want to use an example, a very famous example from the ministry of Jesus. And I think we all know where we're going. Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees. They didn't like the wonderful and deep and profound loving teachings of Jesus Christ. They didn't like Him. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to forgive sin. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. And not only that, He preached a gospel that is by faith. Not by their religious works. And the religious people did not like that. The Pharisees went and plotted how to trap Him by what He said. They sent their disciples to Him with the Herodians. This is interesting. Pharisees, religious party. Herodians, political party. Okay? They had their own reasons for this. The Pharisees were religious party. The Herodians were a um, political party. And they said this, teacher, so respectful. Teacher, they said, we know that you are truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. You, divert to, you defer to no one, for you don't show partiality. Tell us, therefore, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? What's the answer? Don't be so quick to answer. Well, you already know because it's a familiar passage, but why? 
This is why it's tricky. If he said, yes, let's pay the taxes, then the Pharisees will have a reason to condemn him. Because they're going to say, ah, you're supporting the enemy. Ah, you're supporting the ones that are trying to impinge on the rights of worship of the Jewish people. If he says, no, we don't pay the taxes, the political people, the Herodians will say, you're a criminal. It's illegal not to pay taxes. We're going to throw you in jail. It's a win-win situation. But what does Jesus recognize and what does he say? But perceiving their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me? You know, when Jesus says something like that, you know he's about to drop a bomb. You know he's about to get him, right? Hypocrites! Show me the coin used for the tax. Object lesson. Pastor Jess loves object lessons. Show me the coin used for the tax. They brought out the coin. So they brought out and they showed him a denarius. All right. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them. Caesar. Caesar w w was on the coin. Well then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Simple. I don't think the same thing would work today because if I brought out a coin and showed you who was there, the person on the thing is already dead. So I don't know if we can give it back to them. At that time, it was a living person, the Caesars. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. So I don't know what they looked like. They just looked at him. It was so deep, so much wisdom, so profound. They didn't know what to say. They just went away. So since God ordained the government and it requires financial support to run properly, we honor God by paying our taxes. Jesus himself recognized it. Jesus himself submitted to it. Because he knew that, yes, there are earthly authorities and we've got to submit to them. But the overarching great authority is God himself. Yeah, what? Caesar, he, these things belong to him. The, the money belongs to him. This is his government. He's the one that's appointed here. No problem. Give to him what belongs to him. But, the, but remember, everything belongs to God. Everything under heaven and on earth belongs to God. So ultimately... If we pay taxes, and when we pay taxes, we give glory to the overarching authority Himself, God. Think about it. Paying taxes is giving to an institution that God Himself ordained. So regardless of what you think about certain officials, by paying taxes, you are supporting God's design. You are supporting God's design. And if we are to obey with joy, we must obey with one purpose, to honor God. There is no other purpose. Let me ask you right now, why do you obey? Why is it that you're not in jail right now? Why is it that you're here right now, not in a whole bunch of trouble? Maybe you are in a bunch of trouble, legally speaking, and you're still here hiding. I don't know. I could, I could get one today, maybe. Just you know, throwing it out there. Why do you obey? What is the reason? What is the point? Why do you follow the rules and laws of our country on a daily basis? basis. Now let me tell you something. God isn't looking for blind obedience to authority. In fact, it is dangerous to have blind obedience to authority. They might lead you astray. But it is also dangerous not to obey authority because that in itself will lead you astray. But in fact, our minds must be alert and we have to know why we're obeying and for what we are obeying. Mindless, begrudging obedience means nothing to God. Anyone can obey for the sake of it. But the reason we obey is to honor God. If mindless, begrudging obedience gave honor and glory to God, then I guess all the Pharisees are saved. Because they were really good at that. That's not what God is looking for. It's the exact same thing when it comes to the issue of salvation. God isn't looking for us to just pick up this book. Okay, so what is it here that tells me how to get... Oh, there, look, there's a bunch of rules there. Let me go to that, let me go to that bunch of rules. I'm going to follow it. I'm going to be a better person. This is really difficult because we know that we live in a society in this day and age wherein we look around and we claim that this is a good person and that is a good person. Guys, the scriptures tell us that merely obeying the law, merely being an outstanding citizen, because I don't want you to get the wrong impression. You might be sitting here, it might be your first, second, third time or something like that, and you're saying, well, buti pa ako. 
I obey the authorities. I'm doing well. That's great, but we must ask why. I want to say something. If we obey authority, if we submit to authority for any other reason than to honor God, it is sin. It is sin. It is obedience and submission for the honor of thyself or for the honor of false gods. God is looking at your heart. He's looking for why you're doing these things. He's looking for why you're going to church. He's looking for why you listen to your D group leader. Is it because you want to honor God? An article on DesiringGod.org by Greg Morse, moving into Holy Week the other week, he wrote this, and I think it really captures where we're at right now as a people. He says this, We step forward into a world that would rather have Barabbas rob them than Jesus call them to repent. A world of pilots who find no fault with Christ, but who see no glory in Him either. A world of Judases who may kiss Him every Sunday, but betray Him with their lives. A world that pays homage to Caesar instead of the Savior. Remember, there were many people who followed Jesus Yet Jesus said that many of them did not belong to Him. He condemned those people who were obeying Him in order to get something out of Him. If we are merely following the rules, being good people, obeying laws, just for the sake of having a better life because you know that it's okay, you know that you're going to get in trouble if you don't, and not to honor God, we might not be obeying with joy at all. We're obeying begrudgingly. We are obeying in a way that does not honor Him. Remember, this is what Paul says. Pay your obligations to everyone. And he says, taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those who you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Marami naman natin utang. I owe taxes, I owe tolls, I owe respect, I owe honor. We're in debt. No, but... That's kind of funny, but this is true. Pay your obligations to everyone. The Greek word for pay there, it doesn't mean that you're purchasing something. What it actually means is to give back in return. That's why he says pay it, and you owe it, you owe it, you owe it, you owe it. He repeats the term owe. It's a debt. It is paying back in return. So it's something owed. Paul is saying that paying your obligations to everyone, like taxes and like tolls and whatnot, is mandatory. Not only is it mandatory, you owe it. It is expected of Christians. Even if you don't agree with what's going on in certain governments, you need to admit to yourself that one of the reasons why you walk in safety on a daily basis is because there is an authority, a governing authority over our nation that seeks to, whatever you want to say about them, to reward those who do good and to punish those who do evil, we can walk safely. Whatever you think about it, that is the fact. And Paul not only says, pay taxes to those you owe taxes, he says, pay tolls to those you owe tolls. And you might say, I understand, I get it, okay, I get it now, Josh. I pay taxes because the government serves me. The government officials serve me and I benefit out of it, therefore I pay taxes. I get it, there's expenses, I need to pay for it. Tolls, uh, like toll gate, okay, I get it. They made this amazing highway and the government shelled out their own cash and therefore they need to make up the money, therefore I will pay tolls when I pass by the toll gate. I understand that. But what in the world are these last two? Respect to those you owe respect and honor to those you owe honor. We walk around thinking, he doesn't owe my respect. Or he, I don't owe him respect. I don't owe him honor. He doesn't deserve it. In the context of authorities, we owe respect and honor to our leaders. Whether it be in the family authority level, church leadership, and the government, civil state as well. This goes out to all the people around us. It's as if Paul is saying that the attitude of one who truly believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ and has been saved is that you walk around knowing that people don't owe you anything. And that as a slave of Christ, you now owe them everything. Taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and even honor to those you owe honor. It's not us giving them anything. No, we owe it. 
And God even says they deserve it whether you like it or not. And Paul ends with verse 8. He says this, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. When Paul says do not owe anyone anything, he doesn't mean it's illegal to borrow money. He's not saying that. But if Paul were here today, he'd probably shy upon borrowing from your D group. Probably. That's what we say all the time. But he's not saying it's illegal to borrow money. It doesn't mean that. But he is saying that we are obligated to return anything that we borrow, even if they don't ask for it back. That is the attitude of a believer. No matter what, we must always pay our financial obligations. So we should not have utang. Hindi, hindi pwedeng puro utang. And we know what happens when we are in debt or something like that. We borrow money for whatever the reason. And you delay, delay, delay. Next thing you know, you come to church, you see that person. He's sitting there. You make sure you sit there. After service, diretso labas para wala nang problema. We know what it's like. Don't owe anyone anything. Except. A lot of people are laughing because you might have experienced that, huh? Except to love one another. So don't have debt. Wag ka ng utang. Except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. I, I don't understand it. Why does it, why do you, what do you mean don't owe anyone anything except to love one another? Well, here's a series. Paul brings it back to the very root of the issue. Love. Do we love God? We will obey Him. Do we love people? We will respect and honor our authorities. If so, we will obey the people that God has placed to govern us in this lifetime. And if you love one another, look what Paul says. He says, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And you're like, wait a minute, Josh. I go to church. I know the gospel. I can't fulfill the law. I know that. I'm a sinner. I need grace. You're very correct. But what does Paul mean when he says, when you love one another, you fulfill the law? What is the greatest commandment? To love God. And the second is like it. To love one another. He is saying that this is the very fulfillment of the law, which is to be able to really love one another truly. The overarching law above every law for us Christians is the law of love. It is the debt that we have to one another. It is the debt that we will never be able to pay in full. Paul is saying that we basically need to walk around understanding that I owe, as a slave of Christ, I owe every single human being love. I owe it. And I will spend my entire lifetime paying that debt and it will never be fulfilled until, I'll pa until I pass on to the next and be in perfect love with Jesus Christ. This is how we obey with joy. Lastly, you must obey with your heart in the right place. That's the personification of why we can obey with joy. Back when I was going to church, yet doing drugs, I knew it was wrong. Eventually, I tried to stop because I was ending up in jail. I was ending up with problems with the people in the Bible study as well. And they were looking at me and they were looking at me uh, in a bad way. and all those, I was getting in all sorts of trouble. And I obeyed the law merely because I was starting to get scared. I was obeying not with joy. I was obeying with fear. And I want us to check ourselves right now. Are we simply obeying with fear? Are we obeying because we merely fear the consequences? And when I did obey at that time, and I did try to be better, can I tell you something? I want to be honest with you. I never felt joyful doing it. I never felt joyful merely just obeying for the sake of obeying. I obeyed out of fear. But 1 John 4.18 says, There is no joy in fear. In fact, perfect love casts out all fear. I may have been less of a criminal externally, but I was no less of a criminal internally. I needed much more than just begrudging obedience. I needed a new heart. My heart was cold. My heart was rock hard, and it was definitely in the wrong place. Then I looked to Jesus. All my disobedience is placed on Him as He was nailed to the cross. I looked to Him. 
and he gave me a new heart. He put it in the right place. And if you have that cold, rock hard heart right now, if you look to him, he'll do the same for you. We're familiar with Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26. It is a promise of God and you can claim this promise that he has promised to take out people's hearts of stone and put in a heart of flesh and he has promised to put a new spirit within them. The only way that anyone can ever obey with joy is if they have a new heart and if that heart is put in the right place. If that's you with that cold, hard, rock hard um, heart and you're thinking to yourself, I'm okay, but I know that I'm not obeying with joy and maybe you're obeying out of fear. He is calling you to turn from your sin and believe in Him. He has come to grant salvation to those who are disobedient, those who don't submit to authority, those who have rebelled against what God has instituted, and those who have resisted Him. The obedient, once again, for the disobedient. Romans 11.32 says, For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that He may have mercy on all. That is, all who come to faith in Him. Only with Jesus in mind, to the honor of God, with a new heart in the right place, can we ever obey with joy. And when you start doing that, you obey, you obey with joy. It is a beautiful thing to live in a way that you know you are honoring God and you know that even in your obedience, it's not just joyful, it is enjoyment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time as we have read your word and gone through your scriptures. Lord, there's really nothing better that I can ask for right now than that the scriptures would speak to your people. You by your word, directly speak to your people. And I just want to pray, Father, for my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a beautiful Sunday. We're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord, um, as we do every Sunday. That, Lord, we as followers of Jesus may live out the truths that we read in Romans chapter 13. That we would not only obey our authorities at home, at the church, and in government, but we would do so joyfully. And that cannot happen unless we begin with the love of Christ. I pray, Father, that you would spur these people, encourage these people to follow you. Not because they're going to earn something, because they've already gained the most precious thing, salvation in Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you would push them forward, that they may be a walking, talking picture of the gospel when they go out there. When they start submitting and obeying joyfully in a wonderful way, people outside of this place may start seeing the gospel in that. They may start seeing that they fall short and that only Jesus meets the righteous standard because He is God in the flesh and that many would come to Him. And Father, I pray now for the people here who have not been given a heart of flesh, those who are here who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, if you have convicted them, O oh Father, and if your Spirit has overcome them at this moment, that they now see that they are rebels against God in constant anarchy against you, you may draw them to your Son, Jesus Christ, and grant to them repentance and faith. That at this moment today, they may cry out, Father in heaven, forgive me. Father, please have mercy on me. You are the only righteous, holy, perfect one, and I fall short so, so badly. Save me. It is by your grace I know it. If you were to throw me in hell, I deserve it. But if you were to change my heart right now, I'd be joyful forever. Bless them, O oh God, and may we now worship the risen King out of love that His love has overcome our wretchedness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters.